for coming and joining us for this lecture. We're very uh, lucky to have Dr. Omar Mahmoud come speak to us today. Um, and so my responsibility is to kind of give you a brief intro of, uh, of his background. Um, so Dr. Omar Mahmoud is currently a research scientist uh, and an advisor for MINA, which is the Muslim League uh, of North America. Uh, he, he did his undergraduate work in psychology and Arabic studies, and he completed his PhD in clinical psychology um, at Wayne? Mm -hmm. At Wayne. Okay. Um, and his work is basically, from what he told me in the car, um, he tries to link uh, um, uh, neuroscience basically with cognitive behavior. Um, so, I mean, that's all over my head, but that's what I understand. Um, and he's, he's going to talk today about psycho-spirituality. So we hope you enjoy the lecture, inshallah, and I hope breakfast was satisfactory. And thanks for coming out to the 18th annual spring time. Thank you for all coming out uh, and being here for the morning session. The first session is usually the hardest one to come to. And so I appreciate you all being here and I'm honored to be here as well. Uh, so I titled this talk Psycho Spiritual and it's not like psycho like in a crazy band, um, <laughs> but it kind of you know has that. You know, and that, that might be what you think of when you hear the word psycho, but it was just really to kind of talk about the bridge between psychology and spirituality, and sort of the relationship between that and how we as Muslims um, look at our mental, emotional health, as well as our spiritual practice, our religious worship, and the relationship between those things, and how those two things can have an effect on each other, but sometimes they're separate, and so on. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit about that um, today. And just, uh, I was, you know, the, the organizers were kind enough to ask about this type of talk, what about the of Bahrul Rijal? Dear, oh, oh Lord, oh, oh God, I seek refuge in you. And this was a prayer that the Prophet used to make. Oh God, I seek refuge in you from, uh, from uh, worry uh, and sadness. And I seek refuge in you from a bunch of other things he also lists, like weakness or, and the, uh, laziness. Um, seek refuge in you from you know, fear or from uh, miserliness or from being overtaken by debt or being overpowered by oppressive men or oppressors. So many different things that the Prophet is seeking refuge from. Many different things that could happen to you in a human's life of, you know, tribulations, tests, things that could hurt you, things that could um, make your life complicated. And so the prophet, you know, he's teaching us to seek refuge in God from these things. But what always strikes me about this, that, you know, du'a, which came in an in a authentic hadith, is that um, the first thing he mentions are two emotional states. Allahumma inni adhik min alhammi wal hazan. You know, God, protect me. I seek refuge in you from worry and sadness. Out of all these other things, like oppression, you know, debt, you know, weakness, you know, fighting off enemies, all of these things, the first two things that the Prophet mentions is sadness and worry. And the specific words he uses is hem for like worry, which could mean like concern, or if you want to translate that into a modern context, it's like anxiety. You're worried about something in your future. What am, what's going to happen to me? Where am I going to go to school? What kind of job am I going to get? Who am I going to get married to? All of these things are worries about the future. Anxieties about things that have not, ha have not happened. Just what's in your future. And then hesitant is sadness. And you could, in a modern context, translate that to depression. Sadness and being overcome with depressed because of things in your past. Things that have already happened to you, but why did this happen, happen to me, or something that you got exposed to, or something that happened to your family, or something tragic that happened in your history, and you're sad about that. So these are like two timelines, right? Everything that came before you, the Prophet is saying, I, I don't want to be sad about things like that, that I can't control now, they're done, they're in my past. And worry or anxiety about things in the future, which you don't know and you're not in control of either. So there's this, you know, there's this timeline that the Prophet is basically covering from past and to the future. And these are the two most common 
um, mood disorders that a person can have. Like if you look at mood disorders just in psychological settings, you know, I'm a, I'm a psychologist and when we, when we test people or we assess people, we always want to do a check on their mood. And the most common mood disorders in, in, in society are depression and anxiety. And it's just the fact that the prophet is that he's saying that as his very first dua in this whole dua, in his lines of supplication, the very first prayer, he's asking for protection from depression and anxiety. You know, that's another way to, that's another point for us to realize that this is just part of the human condition. This is part of the regular human condition. Everybody feels sadness for things that happen to them. Everybody gets worried about things in the future. That's natural. That's a natural human state. We just don't want it to get to the point where it overpowers us. And that's what the prophet is, you know, seeking refuge from. He doesn't want. He doesn't want to be overpowered by these things. But the fact that you feel some depression or that you feel some anxiety—that's normal. That's normal human behavior. And so. Um, how do you, as a, as a believer in God and a divine plan, how do you like go through your life trying not to get overwhelmed by these things? And understanding that this is a normal part of human nature, that you know people get affected by these things, and these are the two most common ones. Um, you know, just, just a show of hands, you know? How many of you have felt sad at some point in your life? Should be the majority of us, you know? Actually, you know, if someone never feels any sadness, that's actually a, a, a red flag. <laughs> you know, like, something's maybe not quite right, you know. Um, and people who are very, like, you know, realistic, um, sarcastic about the world, they're, you know, they, they feel a lot of depression. If you look at the world, the world is not necessarily the happiest place, you know, unless you're in Disneyland, which is the happiest place on Earth. But um, otherwise, the world is kind of a depressing place. If you just look at the facts of it, right? If you just look at it from a very superficial level, a lot of there's a lot of wars, people are dying, there's a lot of poverty, you know. So, um, you know, it's it's understandable that it's a, it's a common human feeling that people would see that. Um, so, the question that I I you know want to ask first is just to talk about what is mental health, and then what is spiritual health. So. When I, when I think about mental health or emotional health or psychological health, I'm talking about these parts of just a natural human experience. You know, how are you functioning in your day-to-day -day life? How do you interact with things that, challenges that you encounter in your life? Um, and how healthy is your reaction to these things that happen in your life? And when I, when I talk about spiritual health, or when we, when we mention spiritual health, that to me is more like a personal relationship with God. How is your relationship with God? How does your religious practice um, uplift you in a spiritual way? Um, how, how does your, you know, your relationship with God strengthen what you do in a day-to-day -day setting? Um, what types of um, spiritual or religious activities do you do to give you that inspiration, to kind of keep you on the straight path. These, these, this is more what we mean about spiritual health. And I feel like many times you could totally see how those will overlap and, and, and mesh with each other. But I, I also think it's important to think about them as two separate kind of concepts. Because you could add in other types of health, right? You could have like physical health, right? Just like how, how often do you exercise? What kind of food do you eat? You could have physical. You could have like social health, like what type of relationships do you have with people? What's the family structure like? So you could have many different types. You get environmental, you could have the whole, you know, community health, how's the health of the whole community. So you could have many different levels. What I'm saying is it's important to, to sometimes think about these concepts as different things. And, and I'll get to your reason and why that is, which is um, I'm going to tell you about this statement I heard from the, from the pulpit, from the mimbar. Um, one time I was at Juma prayer. I was at the Friday prayer listening to the sermon. And, you know, the Imam got up, the Khatib got up on the on the mimbar, on the pulpit, and gave his sermon. And he said something during the sermon that, like, to me as, as a psychologist, kind of struck me in the wrong way. He said, if you have really strong faith, if you have really strong Iman, you will never be depressed. You know, and I was like, Okay, I, I kind of understood what he was trying to say. He was trying to say that like 
your relationship with God, if it's really strong, then uh, things in the world will seem less, you know, troublesome to you. It'll help you cope with things. I, I understood that, you know, the the message behind what he was saying, but just the presentation was unfortunate to me. You know, I went up to the imam afterwards. I said, look, imam, like, I didn't, I don't really think that was the best way to stay, say it. If you have strong faith, you'll never be depressed. If you have strong iman, you'll never be depressed. And I said, because what you're basically saying then is, if someone feels sad, if someone feels depressed, that means they have weak faith. That means something's wrong with their iman. They don't believe in God the way they should, as strongly as they should. And so I said, like, imagine somebody's in the audience listening, and they're, they're going through some struggling time in their life, and then you get up on the, on the pulpit, and you tell them, oh, if you're feeling sad or depressed, that means you have a weak you know, faith in God. So now the person had an emotional crisis, a psychological crisis, and you added a spiritual crisis on top of that. You know, like, instead of making it better, you made it worse for the person. Because now they're wondering, well, oh, am I really a believer? Like, do, do I not even believe in God now because I'm so depressed? And I feel that's why it's important to separate these things. That, you know, it's not an issue of faith. You know, that, that isn't the, you know, that, that, isn't, that shouldn't be used as a, as a gauge for whether or not you're sad or you're happy or you're anxious or not. Like, these are two separate realities of who you are. And... You know, to, to illustrate that, does anyone know what this refers to? <coughs> the year of sadness or the year of sorrow? Yeah, the year of sorrow, the year of sadness for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He lost these two important people in his life and there was a major event in his community that was really traumatic. His wife died, Khadija, his you know, when she was married to her, she was the only woman in his life for him. Um, she bore him all his children. And um, that was the most important woman to him. And, uh, you know, uh, later in life, even when he married again, and he married Aisha, for example, later in life, Aisha was a young, young younger person, a younger wife, and he would still talk about Khadija, like he would still send gifts to Khadija's friends, um, and there was one, there was one story in particular where like, this is years after she died, years after his wife passed away, um, he's sitting in, in their small little home in Medina, and Aisha, the younger wife, the younger, you know, new wife is, is, in, is in the home with him. And he hears a knock on the door. And something about the way of the knock, when he heard that style of knock, he said, Ya Kuni Hala. Oh, let it be Hala. Hala was Khadija's sister. And for whatever reason, they had the same knock. And he immediately recognized the knock, you know, of his past, you know, of his beloved wife, you know. And sure enough, it was Hala, it was his sister in law. She came, she's an old woman at that time, and she came in, he gave her, he, he greeted her, gave her like all this, you know, um, hospitality, some food, whatever, welcomed her in the house, and the whole time I was just like, who is this, like, who is this old lady, and like, what's the big deal, and like, you know, the prophet had to later explain to her, like, this, is, this was the sister of Khadija, and like, you know, whatever your rank is, you know, with me, of course, you're beloved to me, Aisha, but Khadija, there was no one like Khadija in his life. Um, she died, his wife died. His uncle, Abu Talib, died that same year. There was a major boycott, major economic sanctions against the Muslim community. They were starving. They, people in Mecca, they were not allowed to help the Muslims at all. So the Muslims were starving. They, you know, they were going to pretty traumatic events. And this all happened, you know, the boycott sort of ended around that same time. But they were enduring it for like three years. So at the end of all this, you know, when in retrospect, historians, when they look at this year, they call it the year of sadness, the year of sorrow, because of all the traumatic things that happened to the Prophet in that year. And so, um, if the Prophet had a whole year of sadness, you know, and we, we, we get like worried about a few weeks of depression or something, and the Imam tells you that, hey, you don't really have strong faith in God. And the Prophet, who no one's going to question his faith, 
right? No one's going to question his faith in God. He has a whole year of struggling with his emotional issues. Um, like, just to put that in context, like, just because you go through depressed times or sad moments in your life, it has nothing to do with, you know, meaning you're somehow not a believer or you're somehow not, you don't have strong faith in God. These are human experiences that you go through because of maybe tough things you have that happen to you in your life. That everybody has tough things that happen to them and everybody will feel sad at some point. Um, so that's what I mean by it's not an issue of strong faith versus weak faith. That's, that's not the issue we're talking about here. And I think many times when we talk in our communities, it sometimes gets mixed up like that. Especially when someone says a simple statement like that, just have faith in God. Like, oh, if you're sad, just have faith in God, you know? You know, trust in Allah and you'll be fine. And that's fine. Like, a person should trust in God. They should have tawakkul. They should rely upon their Lord. Of course. But that doesn't necessarily address maybe the emotional issue that they might be going through at a, at a moment in time. Um, so just further examples of this. Um, I don't know. Does anyone know what this is? Who is it? Say louder. Three wise men? No. It's a prophet, yeah. Like This is what happens when I Google the prophet Joseph. In, in the most appropriate way that I could find to present. Like Obviously they have like Hollywood versions and weird posters and things, but like, so this is like, you know, Satan and Yusuf, the prophet Joseph, who was thrown in the well, remember? And he was discovered later by a caravan. They brought him out and they took him in under their wing. Um, um, he was eventually, you know, sold to um, one of the great, uh, one of the advisors to the pharaoh um, in Egypt, and he grew up in Egypt. You all know the story, um, and you know, so they don't like in in many traditions they don't like to project they don't like to project the face of a prophet um, because we don't necessarily know what the prophet looked like, and so we don't want to like assign a certain face to that prophet, right? Like. You know, in most traditions, even when you see like artwork of the Prophet Muhammad, even so, I said them or um, the angel, like Angel Gabriel or something, they don't usually draw the actual face because they don't want like people to hundreds of years later to see that face and assume, oh, this is what the Prophet looked like, exactly like this, and then they get that image in their head, and that might not be accurate. Um, in Yusuf's case, you know, he was also considered the most beautiful, handsome person to ever walk the face of the earth. So it's a good thing. I mean, if we showed his face, all the women would faint and all the men would be, you know, madly jealous and then everybody would be depressed and that would be the whole purpose of my talk today. <laughs> um, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is in the Quran, in the Quran, when the story of Joseph happens, you know, um, Yaqub, the father, he loses his son. And then later the second son gets, gets taken um, because, you know, the younger son gets taken and is, you know, in Egypt. And at that point in the Quran, it says he cries so much that he literally cries his eyes out. Like he blinds, he gets blinded because of that much crying and sadness. Now just think about the state of a person who like lost their two of their children in complete sadness, you know, probably like, you know, uncontrollable sobbing and weeping and crying. And, you know, to the point that he can't, Khalas can't even see anymore. Like that looks like a severely depressed person. And, and, you know, this, again, a reminder, this is a prophet of God. This is not like a normal, just a normal, this is an infallible prophet of God. So no one should be questioning his faith. And yet, even in the Quran, it talks about how he cried, you know, out of that kind of sadness. That was the emotional impact. That's how powerful that emotion was. If you read the descriptions of the prophet Muhammad as well, you'll find a lot of his characteristics were sort of like a sad, reflective person. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was known to, uh, he looked down at the earth more than he did at the, at the sky. He was kind of, a, he had sort of this downcast look to him actually. Sad eyes is what some people would describe. Um, he would tear up a lot at certain moments, you know, um, whether he's listening to verses of the Quran or if something happened in his life, like when his son died, he, he cried. And, um, many of the descriptions of his, his way is like, you know, even when he laughed, he didn't really like, uh, he didn't have like a boisterous laugh. Most of his laugh was like a smile. 
it was like a big smile, but he didn't have like this crazy, boisterous, loud laugh or anything. He wasn't, he was, you know, for the most part, it was kind of like a mellow, he had sort of a mellow uh, presence to him. And so, um, you know, even many of his prophetic characteristics, um, you might assume that it's like a, sort of a sad <coughs> person. And there's so many statements of the Prophet and of the, of the great Sahaba and the great righteous Salihin where they would say things like, you know, if you knew what I knew spiritually, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh a little bit less and you would cry a little bit more. You know, like the reality of what, you know, what we're facing. Um, and so that brings me to the question of if that was how the Prophet ﷺ was, and he was kind of like a, sort of this mellow person and sometimes would even look sort of sad, um, is there such a thing as healthy depression? You know, like maybe there's, a, maybe there's a, some dose of sadness that's okay to have. That's actually, you know, we talked about it being natural, and maybe it helps too. Maybe sometimes it helps to have moments of sadness or reflection and introspection to think about your life and think about where you're going. Maybe it, maybe it kind of gets you, you know, on track. It sobers you up a little bit, you know, because the, the world, the material world is kind of this distracting, you know, intoxicating place. And sometimes you just need to be sobered up a little bit to realize where you are and where you're going. Um, I had this funny experience where, um, does anyone know what the MMPI is? Have you ever heard of any psychology majors in here? The MMPI is a personality test that psychologists give to, you know, almost, you know, any type of patient they suspect personality disorder in. So the MMPI is this long test you gotta take. It's like true, false, true, false, true, false questions, like 600 questions. And when I was in grad school studying this test, they told us, before you study the test, because once you study the test and you understand how it works as a psychologist, then it's not the same. Like, you take the test, you already know the behind the reasoning behind it. So they said, before you even study the test, go and take, take one. As a grad student, just go take it, and then later we'll score it, and then you can learn about what, what goes into this test and how it, how it relates to people's behaviors and psychology and whatever. So I take this test, it's a long test, it's my first year in grad school, I'm just learning about personality disorders, learning about psychological disorders, I take the test, um, and then at the end we score it, and I come out high on depression, <laughs> like clinically high on depression. And I was thinking like, I, I'm not depressed, I don't, I don't, I don't have these like the, the behavioral signs of depression, like people when they're depressed they sometimes lose appetite, they don't eat that much, they may sleep too little or they may sleep too much, um, or um, you know, they get slower in their promotion, they avoid people, like I wasn't doing any of that. They, they don't find pleasure in the things that they used to find pleasure in. None of that was happening to me, so I, I was a little bit confused. But when I went back and looked at some of the questions, you know, so it's true, false. So some of the questions would be like, um, you know, and I'm thinking about it from like a Muslim standpoint, okay? Like some of the questions are like, do you think about death? So I said, yeah. <laughs> you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, visit graves, so it reminds you of the hereafter, you know? Um, do you feel that you're in control of your life? No. <laughs> there's, there's a divine presence in control of your life. So like, they're like, in, in the modern sort of western psychological view, all of these are, are check-offs for someone who's depressed, right? Oh, you don't feel like you're in control? You feel like, like, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not, you know, and that, these type of things, um, where, uh, you know, that almost telling me that, like, in our spiritual tradition, it may almost sometimes seem like, like there's a depressed or sad portion to it, and that's normal, that's considered, like, part of who we are, um, and so I do feel that, um, you know, there may be some benefit, like there's a reason God put that in our hearts, right? Like, why do we feel sadness? <coughs> there must be some wisdom behind it, like the, you know, Allah did not make us random, just randomly without, you know, with no reasoning behind it. There must be some wisdom behind why you feel sad at times, or why you feel worried at times. Um, and so I feel that the point is to, you don't have to avoid emotional stress, but it's just, how do you react to it? You know, how do you um, how do you use that experience? 
in a proper spiritual way. If you feel sad at that moment, that should be a lesson for you, and that should somehow guide you and focus you. Um, if you feel worried about your future, that should be an opportunity for you to seek God's help, you know, pray istikhara, or like somehow seek, you know, some reliance upon your Lord, that realizing, I don't know what's going to happen, if I just, Allah, if I just put it in your hands, then at least, you know, that will calm me down. Um, you know, which is sort of the opposite, you know, in, in a very individualistic society, or, you know, where the individual is, is highly emphasized, you should be in control. You should be planning things and predicting things, and you should be in control of your life. And if you're not in control, you get nervous. But our view is almost the opposite, which is, if we're not in control, if we let God be in control, and He's in the driver's seat, then that makes us less nervous. You know, that, that actually calms us down. Like, oh, I don't have to worry about that. Like, I don't have to, like, try to predict this thing, which I could never have predicted in the first place. I don't have to worry about this thing, which I would have never had knowledge of in the first place. So it's kind of like, you know, giving up that, you know, that, that will and understanding your place in, in, in the divine plan of how, you know, you know, where we are in relation to our Lord. Um, so, uh, you know, how do we use these events in our lives to kind of keep us on a certain spiritual path, you know, and um, how, you know, how does it affect us? How do we respond? Um, to fails in life, you know? Things that happen that you thought were going to happen a certain way and it didn't work out. How do you respond to that? Has anybody, has anybody ever heard of fail blog? Um, it's one of my favorite blogs. It has like a, all these random images of, you know, <laughs> failed events, basically. And one of my favorite ones, I, I thought I had a photo of it, I guess I don't. Um, it's like this, this sidewalk that goes around a neighborhood, and they started the sidewalk, the construction, and they started it, and then when it came at the end, it was like totally mismatched. Like it, 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 the, the beginning of the sidewalk and the end of the sidewalk are like a few feet apart, you know, they don't, it doesn't connect. Or there's one where some guy designed a bathroom, and like, he had the sink, and then the faucet was like a few feet over here, like, he didn't have enough pipe, so you turn it on, like, there's no relationship between the drain and the faucet. Um, and so these are things in life where you try to plan sort of something and it just doesn't work out. You know, you have a failed moment. Um, how do you deal with that? You know, and I think that these are, these are lessons for us to think about, like, from the emotional standpoint and from the spiritual standpoint. Um, you know, the famous story that always strikes me is the, 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 the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians in the Quran. He calls up all these magicians to challenge Moses. Because Musa has the staff, right? Sayyidina Musa has the staff that Allah gave him to throw it and it turns into a snake. So Pharaoh calls all these magicians, and he, you know, this is in Surah Shu'ara, it's, it's in many different surahs, but he calls all these magicians, he's like, you guys can come. And the first thing the magicians say is, are we going to get paid? That's the first thing the, mag the magicians ask. Are we going to get paid? Um, and, and, Pharaoh says, "Yes, you're going to get paid. You're going to be. A, you're going to succeed in the Kumanafaizun. You're going to succeed." Um, so to them, it was just a job. They were just here to do a job. They weren't like theological. They just were showing up. They were called to do a job. So they were going to do their magic, their magic stuff. And they did their magic. They threw their staff down. They turned the snakes. And then Moses throws his staff down. And of course, Satan and Moses, you know, completely annihilates you know the others. And it's clear that what Satan and Musa has is not magic. It's like an actual miracle of God. Um, and so, you know, this was supposed to be a big event, you know, they had people, they called in people to watch it, and so, like, at that moment, that's basically, like, you know, for these magicians, that was it, like, they were done, like, they didn't have any, they didn't succeed at all, and they were before Pharaoh, who they knew was going to, he was going to kill them, they didn't succeed, and yet, in that moment, you know, they just, they seek, like, like, just, they just immediately submit to God's will at that moment when they see the reality, you know, and they said, you know, we believe in the God of Moses and Aaron, you know, Rabbi Musa wa Harun, we believe in the, and, and Pharaoh said, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll cut you up, I'll crucify you, and they said, like, you know, what can you do to us, you know, like, what can you really do, like, after we've seen this truth, you know, so, you know, moments of, like, where things in your life did not necessarily go the way you thought they were going to go. 
actually has like a maybe has like a wise a, there's a wisdom behind it that you didn't realize and you know can positively affect you in your life for the rest of your life um, and that's something that we need to kind of think about we sometimes we get really overwhelmed by the details of the moment and forget to think about the greater picture and that Allah has this plan like Allah doesn't make mistakes things don't happen because they weren't supposed to happen everything that happened had to happen you know, how many of you guys have seen Matrix movies? Remember the scene where in the when they go in uh, Morpheus and Neo and Trinity, they go and they meet the Frenchman and they do the whole thing and then they walk back out and he goes into the elevator and nothing happened. They didn't get whatever they were going for. And Morpheus says, "No, that this was meant. To, this happened exactly as it was supposed to happen." And they said, "How do you know?" He said, "Because we're still alive." <laughs> you know, like it, in other words, it happened in the past. The fact that it happened meant that it happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. So that, and that's, that's truly what we believe, that like as things happen, that's it. It's not like there's mistakes that happen in your past. There's some reason to it, even if we can't grasp it. And so that, that brings you to the point of a, having a good opinion of your Lord. A good opinion of your Lord. And Allah says in a Hadith Qudsi, which is a, a, a statement from God that came on the tongue of the Prophet. He says, I will be according to my servant, whatever their opinion of me is. So think of me what you will. God is saying this, like, whatever you think of me, that's how I will be to you. If you have a good opinion of God, you think that Allah is watching out for you, He's protecting you, He's guiding you, He's taking you up on some path to your benefit, that's what you will see in your life. But if you think God is out to get you, and God is always trying to trick you, and give you the worst, and like disappoint you, then you're going to fulfill your own prophecy and you will see that in your life. That's how you will interpret the world around you. So, I mean, imagine two people can ha be in a, have the same exact thing happen to them and those two people interpret it totally differently. You know, one person sees it as a blessing, one person sees it as a punishment or like, you know, some type of, you know, evil or something. And another person sees it as, you know, some hidden good. And so, having a good opinion of your Lord, it's the same thing as we have good opinion of people, right? We're supposed to give excuses to people, like someone's annoying you or someone's like really like irking you and you're just supposed to give her experience, ex excuses, supposed to give him excuses. Like whoever it is, like just... I don't know why they did that or why they said that. Maybe they had a bad day, whatever. You're supposed to give them, like, maybe they're going through some of their own thing and they're taking it out on me. And you're supposed to do that, like, where you have a good opinion of them. You don't, you don't assume they're somehow inherently evil. You assume that they're good. Um, so that's the same with your Lord. You have to assume that your Lord is good and He has your best interests in mind. So what are the remedies... Um, you know, we talk about, like, you know, that's the other problem, like, we get to when, you know, as a psychologist that I hear from the community is, like, sometimes people will say, you know, I was really depressed, or I was really, you know, anxious or something, was emotionally going, I was emotionally going through some messed up things, and I went to someone, I went to a Muslim, and they told me, like, you know, you just need to read more Quran, or you need to do more dhikr, or something like that. Um, or the worst is, like, Oh, you, you, that's just like some gin messing with you or something. <laughs> that, that does not help the person at all, you know. Um, and not that it's bad to do these things. Yes, you should increase your worship. You should increase your religious practice. You should read more Quran. You should do more dhikr, of course. But that doesn't necessarily translate always to someone with a very specific emotional need at that moment. Um, sometimes, I think the most powerful way to help someone is just to show empathy. To let them understand that, you know, you recognize they're going through something difficult and you, you want to be there for them and you do it in the most non-judgmental way possible. You know, you don't judge the person be like, oh, you're weak or something because you're going through this or something wrong with you because you're going... No, you give them the most welcoming environment for them to thrive in and you give them support. And you'll be amazed how much just a, a person who listens to you, how much that can help someone. They didn't even say a word, but they sat there and they listened to you. 
and they let you like you know say what you need to say and this person just nodded and supportively responded you know and reflected what you were saying <coughs> but didn't like sit there giving you advice or lecturing you just listen and that has such a huge effect um, even in like psych psychological research when they look at what what helps what's the best way to know if a therapist is going to help a client a therapist and a patient the main predictor is the rapport between the two of them how much empathy does the therapist show to the person you know make them feel welcome make them feel like they're normal like normalize a lot of these things for them um, that alone has such a huge benefit um, and, you know, the main thing to ask yourself, you know, or to ask someone if, you know, people come to tell me like, oh, does this person need help or do I need help? And the main question I usually ask is, is your functioning effective? Is your daily functioning effective? Like if you're sad because something happened to you and if you're trying to adjust to this new reality in your life, that's a normal thing. You know, but if you're so sad that you can't eat, or you can't go to work, or you can't function properly with people in your life, then that's a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Like, the person might need to seek professional help, you know? And I think that's a good gauge to use. Because some people assume, like, you know, or people, parents will come to me and say, I'm like, I think my kid has ADHD. I said, why? Because they're running around the playground. I said, you're supposed to run, you're supposed to run around in a playground. Or you're, they're like, they're loud. This kid's four years old. You're supposed to be loud when you're four years old. That's like a normative developmental stage. So my question always is, is the kid unable to function? Are, they, are you saying that they're so distracted and so, so hyper that they can't, like, you know, they can't, you know, learn words or they can't, you know, eat at the right time or they can't, like, you know, do the normal things that other four-year-olds or six-year-olds can do? when you compare them to other kids of the same age and and then that's 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 where you know that's where the question will that's where the answer will come out where if it's a real functional impairment like you just cannot function then we're looking at a serious psychological issue but if it's just something that's kind of annoying or kind of like in the way but for the most part the person can get through their day to day then that's that's something of a lesser degree to think about. It may not require like professional help, but it just may require some support, some like structure um, to get through that. Um, so the thing is, like in our community, you like we trust these guys, right? You know? Nice Indian doctor, nice Muslim Turkish doctor, you know. We trust these guys. If you, like, I, you'll always find in the Muslim community, like, if someone, if you have a broken leg or a, a illness in one of your bodily organs, or you have some diabetes, or you have some medical issue, nobody has a problem going to a doctor. They say, I gotta go to a doctor, I got this problem. But the moment someone has, like, severe depression, or severe anxiety, or some kind of psychological issue, then suddenly it's like, Oh, you can't go to someone and seek help for that. Even though both of them are illnesses, both of them are part of the natural experience of the human being. But for some reason, if it's like a mental or emotional issue in our community, um, we have this stigma. <coughs> we have this idea that like, oh, you're somehow weak or something's wrong with you. Abe, you know, you know, hide that. You shouldn't. You shouldn't be able to like. You should be able to handle this on your own. You don't need help for that. And so. This is something that we need to address as a community. That like, it's just like having a broken arm or a broken leg. If you have something broken with you psychologically, you should be able to get help for that. And the community should support you in that and not actually, you know, blame you for that. That's, that's a condition that you need help with. Um, and that's something that like, you know, I, I'm not sure where, where we went astray and that became like the norm in our community. Where if someone has psychological problems, we, we, like, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to like, acknowledge it. No one wants to even believe that that exists. That we only believe in medical problems, you know? You know, you, and just give me a pill and I'll be fine, you know? But there's this whole reality to, um, to understanding, addressing, and acknowledging that there's this emo mental, emotional side of us that needs to be kept healthy, healthy as well. Just like you need physical nutrition, 
and physical exercise. You need um, emotional, psychological nutrition and spiritual exercise and, and, and some of the non-tangible things, the non-physical things as well. They need to be nourished. Um, I'm going to close with a story. Um, this is a picture in Tarim, Hadramot, in southern Yemen, which is where I, I lived. Um, I took a year off between when I finished my undergrad at UCLA. I took a year off, and before I went to grad school, I, I, I studied um, with some scholars in this, in this town. Um, and the, one of the things that happened to me when I was there is something I'll always remember. Um, so this is like a very remote part of the world. It's in the very southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And it's not, there's not much technology. At that time, there wasn't much te te technology. Now they got like high-speed internet now, but you know, at that time, they didn't have much technology. They were kind of remote. And um, uh, you know, in that time, if you just went to college, if you're someone that went to college, they would call you doctor, you know, like, oh, there's the doctor. You know, and so when they, they knew that I had come from America and I was living there, suddenly like in the village people would be like, oh, doctor, and I wasn't even a doctor, and it wasn't even the kind of doctor that, like, if anything, I had studied psychology, but they would ask me about like their, you know, infected foot or something, and I like, <laughs> had no idea. But one day, someone came into the, into the madrasa where I was at, and so they said like, where's, where's, where's Dr. Omar, and I was like, oh, no, here we go again, like, um, but then the guy said, you know, no, one of the one of the sheikhs in the in the in the town, he wants to see you because of his son. He has he said had an afsia. He has a psychological condition. And so I was like, oh, okay. I was like really, I was excited. I was like, okay, that's more in my line of work. That's more what I'm into. So they took me to this house, and um, I met the kid who's like this 18 year old kid, and it was like. It was one of the clearest times I've seen in my life, like someone who has just, just obvious like paranoid schizophrenia. And this is a this is a disease that happens. It's not very common. It's maybe like less than one percent, you know, of people in the whole world could get it. But it happens, and it particularly can happen in that age range, late teenage years for males. They're um, they're like the highest people that of all the people that get it, they're the highest ones. Um, and this kid had gone through some stressful testing in his school, some like exams he was going through, and then suddenly he just cracked one day, and he, st he thought like everybody in town was talking about him. He would like sort of hear voices, and he just it was not it was not right. It was it was tough, and you could see the pain on the father's face when he would start talking and like these random hallucinations, and the kid was just not with you, and the father was just kind of so sad to see this. And, of course, they did all the traditional, like, spiritual remedies. They did, like, someone, they had a sheikh come read Qur'an on this kid, and they did a lot of dhikr, and they did that. But then what, what struck me about this, the, the lesson I took from this, was that the sheikh, this old, the old sheikh in this remote village, he had also taken his son to see a psychiatrist to get possible med medicine, and then they called me to come and do, like, my evaluation, and what I thought as well. And, you know... This is like, if you want to think about old school, traditional, whatever that means, Islam, that you couldn't get any more old school than this place. I mean, this, they were living that same way for hundreds of years since Islam came there. And, this, and to them, to this shit, it was not like, um, it was not like a, 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 a conflict in his mind that like, yeah, my son has a psychological condition. I need to get professional help for him. You know, like, he, and he was like a shit of like a tradition of like, you know, just old school, like, Islamic knowledge. And that was his mindset. You know, like, he did not see any discrepancy there at all. That, like, oh, this is just purely an Iman issue. Or this is purely a faith issue. Or, you know, something, this is just pure, like, jinn or something like that. He's like, he's, he made a, he might have had some of that, but he also incorporated the, um, the idea that maybe my kid has, like, an actual condition that needs to be treated. Um, and so, like, that always stuck with me because, you know, I see a, a lot of people in our communities where we come to that level where we get, um, we get torn apart like that. And some people will say this is the Muslim way to do it, that, you know, you should just focus on the spiritual remedies and not necessarily the psychological assessment or treatment. Um, so, that is all I really uh, wanted to say. I know we, we're, we're pressed for time, but... Um, you know, I invite you to, to stay in touch, 
my info. Um, you can, um, you gotta, some, some kids only have Instagram now. <laughs> like, some of the young kids, I don't know, like, I, this kid was like 14, he's like, hey, I just gotta get in touch with you, and he's on Instagram telling me this, you know, like, this is your only mode of communication. <laughs> but whatever. Um, it's all the same, it's all the same on the Facebook page, that's my, my, you can send me messages there too if you want to send me messages there. Um, any questions, comments, um, reflections? Whatever happened to that kid? That's a good question. Um, so he ended up getting some medicine. He ended up getting some medicine. Um, uh, but the, the only problem is the medicines that were available to them were like pretty old type, like they didn't get the newest available medicine. So it, I think it helped some of his um, some of his symptoms, but it's, it's kind of like he had to be dependent on those medicines for, for as long as the symptoms were there. Um, this is the last one you mentioned on the kid who uh, was in Maria. Uh, like in the Muslim, in the Muslim community, it's sometimes um, kind of hard for like, parents to like, accept the possibility of their child having depression. Or, like having something, uh, having a medical condition kind of schizophrenia or whatever. Can you talk more about that? Um, you do, I know you do a lot of work in the Muslim community, so how do you, kind of, how do you tell the parents that like, your child may actually have something that's not just spiritual? Um, most of the time it's just dismissed. Yeah. I mean, what I usually find is that like our community doesn't like to talk about things, whether it's mental health or substance use, um, until it suddenly affects someone in their family. And then I get like calls, like, you know, how do we treat this? What do we do about this? You know. And for those parents, um, it actually is a relief for many of them to hear that there's like an actual diagnosis, like what's really going on with my kid, like. No, like, this is something that has been seen before, you know, and so that actually kind of helps them feel a little bit more relieved, at, at, you know, in a weird way, because at least they know the reason why, you know. Um, that it's, so once they get to that severe point, it's a little bit easier, actually, to talk to them. It's more like when I see warning signs, and I want to warn the parents or something, and the parents, like, don't acknowledge it, like, that's the harder discussion to have, like, about, you know, you know, it looks like your kid is going through something, and you know, maybe, maybe they, you know, maybe you should get them evaluated or something like that. And that is the time when I usually get some resistance, and I have to kind of provide education. But I, I find that our communities are slowly, slowly getting more hip to it. Like they want to hear some more education about psychology, about like issues with um, youth and, and generational gaps between parents and youth, and, and so it's slowly like they want to hear more about it. So I think the biggest thing right now for our for our community, is just education, like educating us on on in a large scale level about what what to look for, what are the signs, and you know what how things are treated. Uh, just curious, what made you want to work in psychology? Um, the short answer is like that was the only um, I I uh, I had like. I had like no major in college until like my junior year. <laughs> I took a psychobiology course and that was the first time I got like a really good grade. <laughs> and I was like, okay, maybe this is a sign or something. Because um, I was taking like, I was taking like Native American studies, ethnomusicology, like all the, all the random electives you could possibly take. Um, and then the only other consistent t course I took since my freshman year was Arabic. I took all the Arabic at UCLA that you could take, and then I started taking graduate courses, courses in Arabic at UCLA. So I already had the Arabic major like covered, and that wasn't even my major. Like I just had it so many. But then once I, I took that psychobiology course, I really got interested in the brain, how the brain functions, um, and then that's what um, that's what got me interested in in. I didn't actually think I was going to go into psychology. I thought I was going to go more into neuroscience, like just studying the brain, like animals even animal brains. But then um, I got interested in working with people and understanding how people, like after they get a brain injury, what happens to them, like their memory and their attention and things like that. And that's how I ended up going into clinical psychology. Real quick, um, what's your relationship between the, the work that's happening now? There's this huge explosion of uh, the sort of popular science, popular culture and science books that specifically are focusing on the brain and neuroscience. Yeah. I would love it if, if you could talk, is there a are you thinking about or creating a, a sort of more plain language conversation through a book or some other medium that kind of takes some of these ideas and puts it into some kind of way that inserts an intervention into that 
mm. national conversation around yeah. that. Yeah. You mean like from a from the Islamic spiritual perspective or in just a sense it's like they have it's like the neuroscience of business. Yeah. And like yeah. they have like, you know, all the um uh, um what's his name? Um the, you know, the, the, the science of like inspiration and all these yeah. types of things that are coming out related to neuroscience and the brain, but it's all like I think how you said related to the Western framework. Right. It would be fascinating to see some of that. Yeah, no, I mean I'm trying to like I'm trying to develop like ways to talk about that and like like almost like like little YouTube videos and like blog posts, yeah. you know, but like you gotta you gotta you gotta create like a backlog right. first. <laughs> right. So that you're releasing it consistently. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree, like, that's something that, that needs to be inserted into the conversation, and, yeah, so we can talk more about yeah, that, too. Yeah, we should I have a comment and a question for you. Sure. The first one, which is, uh, I really love the, the, the connection between the spiritual uh, those and the psychological would be, would be, and uh, Zagallah here, it's a very, very nice connection that we need, yeah. that will connect between our beliefs, and to find how to find the tranquility in our life, and how can we find that in our in our life? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in, the, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, "فأيو فأيو الفريقين أحق أمني كن تعلمون." And then he answered, "الذين أمنوا ولم يلبسوا إيمانهم بظلم ولاك لهم الأمن وهم مبتدون." So the connection between the feel tranquil and safe, secure, and the belief and the action. Mm -hmm. This is uh, so I uh, I love that. Then my question to you. As a parent, uh, I'm trying to teach my children that uh, going be beyond the blind faith that Islam is the best for us, and, and and as well, I'm trying to interject to them why why it's not just blind faith. This topic is very important that can give them the, the to live in tranquility, which is uh, the uh, the object of every one of us, every human being, whether Muslim, Christian, whatever or atheist to live in peace. Right. But for us as Muslims, we have a big asset to do that. Yourself as a specialist, that is a Muslim at the same time, psychiatric, and so you will not, you will be in the area of uh, uh, prescribing the road map for that. Do you think in Islam in specific, which is which is, might not be find, found in other religion, there might be a good recipe for this tranquility and psychological stability, right. uh, which might not be in other religions, although other religions, other ideologies might provide mm -hmm. this kind of support. What's the special in Islam? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think um, I think I think we do have a good roadmap for that. We have a good we have some particular particularly effective methods in our tradition, um, and then. You know, I think the richest, some of the richest data that we have is just, you know, the actual character and practice of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi You know, and so like that is one of our, you know, if I were to say what's the, the advantage that we have, like is, is that we just have such detailed information about how he reacted to death, you know, of the family member, how he reacted to uh, community trauma, how he, you know, how he expressed his emotions even, and what he encouraged or discouraged even in his own community like you know and so we have so many behavioral techniques that we have in our tradition that that are designed towards you know keeping the person more balanced more at peace you know in a tumultuous world like we we, we acknowledge that the world is a tribulation you know al mu'min mubtala you know the world is a tribulating is a you know, tr filled with trials and tribulations so that's that's how we start from looking at the world the the dunya at least the material world and so it's all about how to attach then everything you do in this world to some spiritual relationship in the akhirah, you know. So then um, I feel like a lot of what we do, and even though we do, we might do the exact same things that any other human being would do. It has a lot to do with the intention behind it, and and uh, you know the goal, I guess, out of it as well. So you know, even when we, um, you know, like whatever it is, like. Our, our fa the way we look at fasting, for example, where you're stopping yourself from eating, and you know many people diet, right, in the world, but and we're doing. If you just look at it on a physical level, we're doing the exact same thing, but we have a, a different intention and mindset in which we perceive it, and so that changes the whole reality 
I think, in, in terms of the heart and the spiritual aspect of it. So I feel like there's just so many things in our tradition like that where we're taught not only to do something, but to intend a certain thing with it. Um, and that a, a, lot of our, a lot of our acts, you know, that we do, religious acts, are not simply acts, but they're also um, matters of the heart. You know, and, and we have, they're, they're intimately linked. Um, and so I, I feel like that is something that, you know, that we try to do. So like, you know, with, with young people, when we're teaching our tradition, we just we have to be careful not to just focus on the outward aspects of what we do as Muslims. Physically do this, do, pray like this, make dhikr like this. And also, what should you be thinking about in your heart? What should you be thinking about in your mind? And how is this attached to the hereafter? Because ultimately, there is no... There is no tranquility in this world. The only tranquility you truly feel is if it's connected to the hereafter. Um, if you if you limit it to only this world, you know it, that's fleeting, at best. You might have moments, but it's fleeting. Like if you want constant tranquility in the face of all types of tribulation challenges, it needs to be attached to the afra, and that's I think a strength of our tradition. Um. You talked about Rasulullah so being um, like mellow and a little bit like introspective and sad, but they also talk about Rasulullah <coughs> always like having a smile on his face. Yeah. Like, so how do you like balance that? I guess is it just like a, you're inside? Yeah, you're introspective and sad about things sometimes. But I, I don't know. I'm just trying to. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, and I, I don't want to paint him as if he was like constantly gloomy. He wasn't. It's just like, on average, if you were to look at him, he would usually be in an introspective state, tending to be looking down, tending. You know, even the day that he conquered Mecca, it said that he conquered, when he came Yom al-Fatih into Mecca, his head, they said his beard was touching his chest. You know, he didn't enter as like this, you know, ecstatic, like, yes, I, I won kind of thing. Like, even that, even when he entered, it was like this humble sort of like, you know, solemn state. And, and he won. It's not like they were the, lo that, the losers. He actually won. But, you know, to him it was all about, you know, worrying about the state of the ummah and mercy and things like that. And so I think, you know, but he still had normal human interactions. He still had, and the other balance for us is that he recognized there were differences in the people around him too. Like some of the people were like, he had Omar ibn Khattab who's like, had like anger management issues, right? Like really angry guy and like, but sometimes he had to calm him down. But then there'd be other guys that were sort of jokers and he would laugh with them and, you know, and he kind of accepted everybody where they were. Like, people have individual differences, and that's fine. Like, you know, um, it was just this concept, like, you know, we, we tend to think about if you're going to have a balance between hope and fear, you know, you should be hopeful for the mercy of God. You should also fear a little bit about your state before God and punishment and things like that. And many of the scholars would say, if you're going to err on one side, err on the side of fear a little bit more. You know, keep it towards the middle, but have a little bit more fear, because that motivates you and keeps you more on track, you know, but still don't lose hope in, in the grace of God as well. Um, I guess the question is like, I know the Prophet so -so had like companions that like, um, I was just listening to a lecture on this a couple days ago, that like we're not as affluent and like a little bit more hard on themselves, I guess. So how do you like friends that have similar attributes? Like that are a little harder on themselves, have a little harder time on split stuff? How do you be that friend, I guess? Say again, like how like how do you emulate the prophet like, you know, being being that companion, being that friend for like your for that friend that's not exactly like going through the uh, going through stuff. Or he's going through some sorry. Like, so, like, how do you support them? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, how do you take people where they are, you know, and like show them? The, the hardest thing to do is not is to withhold judgment, you know, because we're very judgmental beings. Like, we're so quick to judge people. And like, we have to be able to withhold that and kind of um, be very accepting and provide warm, nurturing places for our friends to, to interact with us or people we, we cross paths with. Um, so I think like that would be the thing to kind of keep in your mind. Like, and you might not naturally do it initially. Like, it's hard to be forbearant, right? It's hard to, like someone's like being really annoying or really like, you know, just stressing you out in front of you. It's hard not to react to that. 
and the, the characteristics of all the prophets were whenever they were cursed, or whenever they were like, you know, treated badly, they always were like calm and like treated it with kindness and tried to understand where is this person coming from. Like, maybe I can somehow help this person, you know? I mean, even people that were just straight, like, you know, against them, the prophets, all the prophets of God always treated their enemies with kindness and, and, and almost empathy, you know? Um, and so I think for us as normal human beings, that's hard to do. So we have to sort of approximate it. We have to try it out. We have to, we have to practice it out, you know, and sort of tell yourself, remind yourself, like, that this person is going through something and I need to be there for them. Even though you don't necessarily maybe feel it right away in your heart, um, you know, or you, you want to react in a way, but you have to kind of tell yourself, no, don't react in that way. And it's all, you wish you could just not feel hatred for this person, you know? Like, I wish I just didn't hate this person. But if you're not at that level, then at least tell yourself, at least tell yourself how you should act. And with practice, it'll become more natural and more of an automatic response. It takes a long, so the, the Arabs have a saying, If you want to have that hilm, that forbearance of the prophets, you're going to have to practice it. You have to approximate it along the way. Like you're not going to just have it immediately. Like you have to practice it out and try it out and tell yourself, like, I need to act this way or help this way, be non-judgmental, even though you're probably totally judging this person. Like, you have to like not let it come out of your mouth. Like, and just remind yourself, and then slowly it'll become more and more natural to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.